Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast updates. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Lintel Washington was everything that you could have asked for in a teacher. Sadly, her life was cut short by her boyfriend. Lintel began dating a man named Robert Marks, who happened to be the assistant principal at her school. She eventually got pregnant and Lintel soon found out that Robert was still with his wife, even though he had told her that they were getting a divorce. On June 9th of 2016, Lintel, who was seven months pregnant, was reported missing after her three-year-old daughter was found wandering around alone in a parking lot. Her daughter apparently told investigators Mr. Robbie hurt her mom and that she was now sleeping. Lintel's decomposed remains and the remains of her unborn child were found June 14th of 2016 in a ditch. She died from a gunshot wound to the head. Robert was arrested on suspicion of murder and other charges. He went on trial in December of 2021 and was convicted of second-degree murder, second-degree kidnapping, first-degree feticide, aggravated kidnapping of a child, obstruction of justice, carjacking, and four counts of using a firearm while in commission of a violent act. The jury reached their verdicts in just 35 minutes. In February of 2022, a judge sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Let's look back at the conversation I had with Mike Cavaluzzi about the murder of Lintel and her unborn child. A former assistant principal in Louisiana is accused of killing a pregnant teacher who was carrying his baby. The principal was married and having an affair with this teacher who worked at the same school as he did. And apparently the fear of being found out about the affair and the baby was the motivation for the murder, according to authorities. Now, though the murder happened in 2016, Mike, he, the assistant principal, is now facing new charges. And we will explain why four years later he hasn't gone to trial and why there's a new set of charges. It's a little complicated and it has to do with jurisdiction, has nothing to do with the evidence or the actual crime itself. Okay, let's get right to it, Mike. Here's what happened. Robert Marks was an assistant principal at a magnet school in Baton Rouge. 40-year-old Lintel Washington was a teacher there, and the two had been having an affair. She was seven months pregnant with his baby. She was found dead. Now, friends say that Lintel was in love with him. She was swept off her feet. They'd been together for a year, and apparently he he had told her when they first got together that he was unhappy with his marriage, that he was in the process of getting a divorce. So obviously he was available for a relationship. You know where this is going, right? I do. Yeah, because it's always the same old story. Yeah. Lintel was a single mom. She had a three-year-old daughter. She had been named Teacher of the Year. She was a distinguished educator. And so everything appeared to be going great in her life. New man, new baby on the way. So a fabulous new future on the horizon for her and for her little girl. Okay. But then Lintel found out that the assistant principal had not left his wife. He was actually still married. And all of a sudden she realizes, this is according to friends, she realizes, dear Lord, I'm not the girlfriend. All of a sudden I'm the mistress and I am not okay with that. That is not the relationship I entered into. So she's obviously very upset about this. And so at the time of Lintel's disappearance and murder, she was pressuring Robert Marks to accept responsibility for the baby, to to acknowledge their relationship, and to tell his wife. And friends say that she had threatened that if you don't tell your wife about me and the baby, I will tell her. Okay. So if that's the inciting incident that, that, that just triggered a domino of horrible, horrible, horrific crimes against this woman, I would say that was it. And of course, that is not the answer nor the solution. Of course not. But it so often is the unfortunate answer in cases like this, is that when men fear some kind of disclosure to a spouse or a girlfriend, or if they suddenly have to take upon the responsibility of an unwanted pregnancy by the woman they're having an affair with. Uh, It is just all too often that they choose this uh, tragic recourse. It never makes sense to me, Mike. 
why kill the person? How in the world is this a better solution to the problem? Yet over and over again, whether it's divorce or the telling of an affair, we see this as the answer. It's unbelievable to me. Well, you should watch Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors because the, the entire movie is about exactly that. It's about a man who's having an affair and the woman is threatening to tell his wife and he thinks that the only answer is to do away with her. And it's an, it's an interesting result. It is, but I have a thing about Woody Allen where I can't watch his movies anymore. <laughs> I get it. I right? understand. You know, the accusations against him and marrying his daughter, adopted daughter, it's, I can't, I can't go there. I hear Okay, you. and apparently your dog agrees with yeah. me. <laughs> What I find so upsetting beside the crime itself is how authorities discovered that Lintel was missing and in danger. It's almost as horrific as the crime itself. So on June 9th of 2016, Lintel's three-year-old daughter is found walking alone in a parking lot on the street of Baton Rouge, and she's near the her mother's car, which is parked, and they're parked near where they live in an apartment building. This little girl is walking around. She's three by herself and her feet, her little feet are covered in blood. Turns out that is her mother's blood. It is unbelievable to me what this child has been put through and what she may have seen and what she may have heard and experienced. It's horrific that anyone, especially an educator, would do this in front of a child. Yeah, that's what's really, really shocking. I mean, unfortunately, we've seen seen situations um, in terms of the motivation for this murder and the circumstances of this murder. We've seen those time and time again, but it is so horrific that this happened in front of a three-year-old girl, and then that three-year-old girl was left to just wander the streets. And I just can't even imagine how this will impact the rest of her life and how there are memories buried deep inside of her that we might not even know yet. Oh, absolutely. So police get called, right? Because there's an abandoned child walking around with blood on her feet. And Incredibly, the little girl, you know, because three-year-olds can be somewhat verbal and they're very good at, you know, pointing, leading, right? And so the little girl leads the police to the car. Now, this is her mother's car. And they say that inside the car was a huge amount of blood. But what was really weird was that in the car there was blood, but there were no clear bullet holes or shattered glass or anything else other than blood. The little girl told police that she was with her mother and Mr. Robbie, right? Which would be what a little girl would probably call an adult, Mr. Robbie. And she said she was with her mom, Mr. Robbie, when she heard a loud noise. And then she saw him cleaning up blood. The little girl also said, mommy is in a lake, which ultimately ends up being a ditch. But the girl was very clever to know it was water, right? That's right. That's right. So in her brain, it's not just water. It has to be like a lake or a river. Yeah. So she was very smart that way. And then she said she told police that Mr. Robbie hurt her mother and that she was now sleeping. None of this is good. And when you see the amount of blood. So obviously police know this is a dangerous situation, meaning If she is indeed still alive, if the mother's still alive, they have to act quickly. So massive search begins by air, by land, bloodhounds, everything you can possibly imagine. But they cannot find the mother's body. In the meantime, because several days pass, it'll be about five days or so from the time that the little girl is found walking around until her mother's body is found. In that time frame, police start doing what they do. They start interviewing. Well, they want obviously the first thing police want to know is who is Mr. Robbie? And that doesn't take long to figure out because obviously her friends and family knew she was in a relationship with him. So they start interviewing and they start getting an entirely different story. Now they know that there is an affair. 
there is um, some kind of dispute over whether he's going to own up to the baby and do the right thing. Wait a minute. He's married. Hold on a second. She's challenging him. Okay. So they also go through phone records. Obviously, they go through Lintel's phone records, and then ultimately they go through Mr. Robbie's phone records. And here's what's very interesting. In text messages, according to police, Lintel asks Robert if he was, quote, attempting to avoid his responsibilities with our, quote, unborn daughter. That's according to the Associated Press. So now we know they're having a little girl and they're what what value is that right now? Because remember, the little girl's been found. Teacher is missing. And we know she's pregnant and probably lost a lot of blood. Yeah. So that that's that information is going to point police. Right. Yeah. To and Mr. Right, Robbie. Right, yeah. Right. To Mr. Robbie. And also the it makes the crimes that much more serious because it triggers a kidnapping charge. Um, it triggers a separate murder charge for the unborn ch- born child because it's seven months. That child is viable outside of the womb. So it is a full life. So he is now charged with double murder, kidnapping for murder. And these expose him to um, special circumstances charges and perhaps the death penalty. So Assistant Principal Robert Marks told authorities that he last saw Lintel at Walmart around 8 p.m. on June 8th, and that they just met there to talk. Now, this is important because June 8th, this is the day before the little girl is found missing. So he's claiming that's the last time that he saw his girlfriend, mistress. But the cell phone tells tells a different story. (laughs) Yes, it does. His cell phone and her cell phones track. They show that they travel to... Iberville Parish later that night before returning to the area where the car is. So basically, both their cell phones, right, tracked in the same locations, and ultimately both somehow ended up back at the car. So police know that's not true, and they're using the GPS information to search those areas where they believe the two of them were which could lead them to either where she was killed or where her body is. Yeah. Well, the search continues. It doesn't turn up Lintel until a farmer goes out to an irrigation ditch, the lake that the little girl mentioned. Yeah. Five days later on June 14th in an irrigation ditch near a sugarcane field is where Washington was found. She was dead. So was her the baby she was carrying that was seven months old, she had been shot in the head at close range. So police believe that Robert shot Lintel in the head at a landfill, then carried her body, put her back in the car, which would explain why there was so much blood in there, then drove her body. This is the amazing thing, though, Mike, with the little girl in the car the whole time. Right? Because she heard the gunshot. Then she sees mommy coming back into the car. Then she sees mommy being carried out. Then mommy doesn't come back. He drives her home, essentially, and just leaves her in the car. She could have walked in traffic. She could have been killed. She could have been abducted by someone who would have killed her, right? A million things could have happened to that little girl. And he was probably hoping they would have happened, unfortunately. That is one of the tragedies, is that knowing that she was a witness... Perhaps he was hoping that something bad would happen to her and she would not be found or she would not be able to be a witness against him. Oh, that's so diabolical. I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. Uh, But it's not, you know, it's just, it it makes makes me wonder, it makes me wonder, though, whether on some level this was a crime of passion, because it's hard to imagine that he would have sort of planned this and gone through with the plan to murder Lintel in front of her three-year-old daughter and not have a plan of how to deal with the daughter. And so either this was a crime of passion on some level, they had some kind of an argument and things went south and he suddenly came up with the idea of this being a solution, or he had plotted this out and this little girl 
was something he hadn't thought of. And that suddenly she was a part of this and he didn't know how to deal with her. Oh, it's, it's all makes my stomach turn no matter it's how you look at so it. It's all so horrible. Oh, geez, Louise. Well, so again, the, the daughter is a witness to all of this. Oh, let me ask you this, Mike. She's three years old. She's not going to be put on the stand. I mean, by the time, well, actually, no. Now she's um, about seven years old because four years have passed. Yeah. Would so, she ever be put on the stand? So generally with child witnesses that age, there are a number of things that you need to consider. And first and foremost is whether they are competent to testify. And that is whether at that young age, because three is very young, they understand the difference between the, the truth and a lie. Okay. And they understand what the value of that difference is. So that is one of the early things that law enforcement does before they even interview these kids. And those interviews are often captured on videotape. So if in fact they questioned her and it appeared clear that she understood what, it, what the truth and a lie is and she were testifying honestly um, and spontaneously as to what she knew and saw, they could use that evidence to then um, restore her memory as she gets older. So to make sure, and this might sound awful to some viewers, but to make sure that she doesn't fully forget and become incapable of testifying, they may find ways to preserve her memory and make sure that she is able to testify four years later to what she witnessed at three years three years old. And, and, and those interviews are often conducted by non-law enforcement individuals, by social workers or child psychologists, people who have a specific expertise in interviewing kids of that age. But that is very young. We more commonly see young witnesses who are seven, eight, nine, ten years old and more clearly understand that difference between uh, right and wrong, the truth and a lie. But a three-year-old, they are just reaching that uh, place of consciousness. And like you said, they're becoming very talkative. And so so it, is, it is possible, Mike, that they could then just use those videotaped interviews as evidence and not have to put the child on the stand. It's possible, but it's challenging because the, child is, because the child is technically available as a witness. And the defense has, should have the opportunity to question that witness. And as indelicate as it may seem, and as awful as it may seem, um, you know, this defendant still deserves a defense. He still deserves an attorney. He still deserves the opportunity to make any arguments that he thinks are relevant, if not to his innocence, perhaps relevant to the charge itself. For example, if this were a charge of a crime of passion, that impacts what he ultimately gets convicted of. But the other way they could use this testimony, the, the statements of the child, in a really smart way is, um, as you know, all out-of-court out of statements are hearsay. Every, out, every statement that's made out of court is hearsay, and it, often it's not allowed in a trial. Okay, but there is a non-hearsay exception here, which is when statements are made to show why certain actions were taken. So maybe perhaps the police can use the statements of the little girl and what she said, not for the truth of the matter asserted, but how those statements impacted their own investigation. And that would be an exception to the hearsay rule and may allow those statements to come in without ever exposing that little girl to cross-examination. Yeah, because that would definitely be very traumatic, as if it's not traumatic enough. Very traumatic and very hard for a defense lawyer, not something that any no. of us would, would like to do. Right. So then two days after Lintel's body is found, this would be now June 17th, Robert Mark, Robert Marks, is arrested on charges related to Washington's three-year-old. It's very interesting, right? They're still trying to figure out how she was killed, who yeah. may have killed her. But what the authorities decide is, you know what? We can arrest him because of the little girl, because the little girl says she was abandoned by him. Yeah. So 
they arrest him for aggravated kidnapping, desertion of a child. And then, of course, he would be facing the more serious crimes of potentially first degree murder. And of course, it is. Is it called feticide? Am I pronouncing yes. that? Yes. Or feticide? F- f- feticide, I think. But it's honestly not a term that I've come across very often. I mean, these types of cases are unbelievably rare where um, uh, children are killed in the womb and considered victims of murder. They're not cases we see every day. No, and sometimes they just go ahead and they charge murder on that child, not just feticide. Yeah. Right? Yes, but I'm not saying... Fetus- yes, that's right. That, that they use a different that, term is what I'm that, saying. That, that, that's right. That's right. Here they're saying that, and this is probably based on the statements and the understanding that he didn't want that child. They're saying that he was specifically intentionally committing, I'm going to say feticide, um, as opposed to the child just dying as a collateral consequence to, to murdering the mother. So now let's go. We go from June to October. Robert Marks is indicted on second, second degree murder and then the murder of the baby. He claims that he's innocent. His attorney says at that time, look, the two of them were friends, but that was it. And he would not at all address the allegations that Lintel was carrying his baby. Now, this is what I find interesting. And this this is like a pet peeve of mine. Why second degree murder on this? Because first degree murder very specifically requires premeditation, which is some degree of time in which a plan is made and executed to kill someone. So he had a gun. He shot her. Understood. Right? No, that's all understood. But if you don't really have extremely specific facts to really show that planning and execution, it is very common for the prosecution to start with a second degree murder charge while they develop the first degree murder investigation. Because here it was something, like I was saying earlier, Anna, that if you don't know the exact circumstances of what happened, it is possible that he carries a gun with him, that he had a fight with her, that she was being, in his mind, unreasonable, that he was in immediate uh, danger of her reporting this to his wife and his entire marriage falling apart, his entire life falling apart. And he immediately developed a, not developed, but immediately acted upon a passion to get rid of the problem. And he pulled out his gun and he shot. That is a possibility. That could be a defense, that this was not planned. It was not premeditated. And then it falls down to second degree murder. And what will get you even more upset is that it could even drop further to a voluntary manslaughter, which carries significantly less time um, than a second degree murder, because at least in California, Second degree murder still can carry life. Mm. Um, A voluntary manslaughter, which is what his defense attorneys most likely will argue for, does not carry life and carries significantly less time. And what we have not heard yet, even though there have been several indictments, and we'll explain that process in a bit, is we have not heard really much of the forensic evidence, any DNA, any of that. Um, But it, you know, what was she fighting any we we haven't heard yeah you know it it is really interesting though because over the last especially the last decade or so cell phone records have become a kind of dna evidence to track someone and where they are what they're thinking through text messages social media so that in and of itself that cell data information the defense will definitely get their own experts to verify whether these towers were accurate in determining where each of them were, Robert and Lintel. But um, it could really help develop the prosecution's first-degree murder theory, showing that he lied about when he last saw her, okay? And that could show consciousness of guilt, consciousness of a plan, and also that he drove her around to different locations, showing a premeditation to kill her. So these cell phone records, because I, uh, you know, I've been doing this for over 20 years. And when I first started, there were not these social, these cell phones that could be tracked everywhere. There were not smartphones. There was not social media and all of these ways that law enforcement has now 
to develop their cases and to find their suspects and prosecute them. Well, here's something else that frankly does shock me. During this entire thing, his wife, yes, his wife stands by him. It's like, really, lady? (laughs) Okay, now get this. So the principal's wife, Kayla Marks, decides to go on the Nancy Grace show. Let's all bow to the great goddess of crime reporting, (laughs) Nancy Grace, right? Nancy Grace. Nancy Grace. She has my respect without question, all right? She goes on the Nancy Grace show and she tells the world, Mrs. Marks tells the world that she doesn't believe that her husband killed the teacher. Because my guess is it's probably impossible for her to imagine, I would agree, if someone that close to me could do something as heinous as this, right? It's not like it's a struggle and one fell down, bumped yeah. their head, right, fell but, off a cliff kind of thing. But it also shows how men like Robert Marx victimize women over and over again in different ways. You know, when the wife herself becomes a victim of his manipulation, his lies, perhaps his emotional abuse of her, or whatever he does to try and persuade her to stay on his team. You know, so it's just men like that. It is not uncommon for them to target and pick out women who are susceptible to that kind of, um, we'll call it BS. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I don't think that Mrs. Marx actually helped him. I mean, definitely it was a curiosity. It's like, what? Well, what does she see in him and why does she believe this? Okay, so she doesn't believe that her husband killed the teacher. And she said that her husband was truly a loving man and a great husband. But here is where I think she may have actually hurt her husband's case. So Nancy Grace, in full-on Nancy Grace style, presses the wife about where was he on the night of the murder? Was he with you, Mrs. Marks? No, he went to a friend's house to watch a basketball game. Nancy Grace is like, really? Where did he go? What is that friend's name? And Mrs. Marks, the wife, never, ever was able to say who that friend was. It's unclear whether, one, she doesn't know the person's name. Two, the person may not exist, right? Three, I mean... She may she may very well be thinking, wait a minute, you know, in that moment where you're being pressed on television to tell yeah. to tell the truth. So if that's his alibi, and here's the other problem I have with that, right? The cell phone data does not show him sedentary somewhere. Yeah that would corroborate that he's sitting in somebody's living room watching a basketball game. So for Mrs. Marks to go on television, defend her husband, and then then try to provide such a shady alibi. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but also from her perspective, in terms of how useful a witness she would be for the prosecution, um, she might be able to say she was nervous on TV, she was confused, She was thinking of another night, a different friend. The more powerful evidence is what you talked about um, right after that, which is, again, that DNA-style evidence of cell phone tracking, which is very, very hard to defend against um, because it's become very sophisticated, very reliable about where someone's phone is pinging and what sort of circumference of area they're in based on where their phone is. So while that sideshow is playing out on television, the prosecutors and the courts get into a dispute about which parish or county has jurisdiction over this case. So all of a sudden, everything is shifting in the legal system. Now it's not so much about, you know, the the murder and everything. It's like, where did the murder occur? Because a judge rules, look. I realize you have this indictment. You got this indictment from this parish. But there is some question as to whether the murder occurred elsewhere and her body was found elsewhere. Therefore, we need you, meaning the prosecutor, to go back to a different parish 
yeah. and sit another, convene another grand jury and go through this all over again. Can you imagine? That's what, this is what the government and what prosecutors have spent the last four years on. Yeah, yeah. Convening two grand juries that ultimately came up with the exact same conclusion. Yes. Right? Which yeah, is, but, but jurisdiction is a legitimate legal question. I mean, that is, it, it's considered a technicality by people. But well, I don't understand, matter. Mike. Explain to me. So does it matter where the murder is com- is committed versus where the body is found? Absolutely. It's where, the, because there, there are two different crimes. One of them is the murder itself. And jurisdiction can be about county, about city, about state. And the other is transporting the body, which is not the murder. <laughs> You're transporting the body into another county, and that becomes its own separate crime of where you're dumping the body, but it's where the murder occurs, which is what triggers that jurisdictional question of who has the authority to arrest and prosecute. So if if a body's found in California, but the person was murdered in New York, the murder trial is going to be in New York and not in California? Absolutely. It's where the murder occurred. New York has jurisdiction. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> a crime reporter learns something every day on one of these podcasts. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, ultimately, Robert Marks was indicted again. <laughs> same charges, same thing. The and that and that's what what triggered us to yeah. revisit this case now.